In this video, I'd like to talk about what a feature class is. If you've been working with certain GIS software packages, especially ArcGIS, this is definitely a term that you're going to see, and it's also a very fundamental concept in GIS data theory. So we're going to talk about it from uh, two different angles. Importantly, this term has both a broad meaning and a narrow meaning, and according to the narrow meaning of feature class, a feature class is a specific kind of vector data format that is different from a shapefile that we can use when we're constructing geo databases. Remember that we said that we have a variety of different file formats that we can use to store vector GIS data, of which a shapefile is just one. Well, feature class, in the narrow sense, is another when we're talking about geo databases. But we're not going to be getting into GIS uh, geo databases in this video series. And so here in this video, I want to focus on feature classes in the broad sense. So a broad sense, in the broad sense, a uh, vector GIS data file that conforms to a certain set of criteria is a feature class. And so whenever you're constructing a GIS data set, you need to think about organizing the vector data that you're going to be collecting or that you're creating into feature classes. Uh, and this is going to help you out with efficiency and it's going to be part of our best practices. Uh, but by the way, I would say that if you're working with a geo database environment and uh, so you're using feature classes in that narrow sense of the term, the feature classes in the narrow sense of the term within the geo database also must conform to these three criteria as well. So they have these uh, criteria, uh, but then plus they are themselves a particular uh, file type for lack of a better term right now. Uh, so keep that in mind. This always applies. So in order for a data file to be a feature class in this uh, broad sense, the vector data file it is about vector data, by the way. Vector data file must conform to the following criteria. First, every feature in the data file must have the same geometry type. So every feature in the file must be represented uh, as a point, for example, in order for it to be a feature class. Likewise, they would all have to be lines, or all areas, or all volumes. You're not permitted to mix and match different geometry types. If you're in a situation where you need uh, some features that you're going to be working with to be represented with one geometry and then other features to be represented with another kind of geometry, uh, then you're going to need to have more than one vector data file. Uh, for instance, if you're going to represent roads uh, and fire hydrants within your GIS data sets and you want to represent roads as lines and fire hydrants as points and both of those may be perfectly reasonable things to do uh, within uh, the purpose that you're going to be applying the data sets uh, then you're going to have at least two different vector data files you're going to have at least two different uh, feature classes uh, remember that if you're working with shapefiles, the software is going to enforce that since it's impossible to have more than one geometric representation for the features inside of a single shapefile anyway. So the file type automatically enforces uh, this first criteria of the feature class. And you're actually going to find that that's the case with many different vector GIS data files that uh, they only can handle one type of geometry anyway. So the software sort of enforces uh, the first criteria for us. Same geometry type. So what's the second criteria? The second criteria for a feature class is that all of the features in that data file must have the same attributes. If you're trying to represent both roads and let's say uh, water pipelines in a GIS, then representing both of them as lines may be very reasonable, uh, a very reasonable thing to do for your purposes, but you're probably going to want to store very different kinds of attribute information for them. For the roads, you're probably interested in the speed limit, for instance. But the road, uh, each, you know, perhaps each road or road segment uh, would have a speed limit that you'd like to assign to it, record for it, and record that in the attribute table. But the water pipes, they don't have a speed limit. So that's not something that uh, you're going to need to store for them. But you may be very interested in knowing the diameter of each section of the pipe. So we could store the diameter of the pipe in the attribute table. That's not something that the roads have. So here we're in a situation where, yes, 
we're using the same geometry type, uh, the same geometric representation for each of these, the pipe and the roads, but we're going to be storing two very different sets of attribute information, and so we're going to have two different feature classes. This means two different vector data files. If you're working with shape files, then it would mean two different shape files. I have noticed that when some people are starting out, uh, I have seen them try to digitize, for example, the roads and the water pipes into the same shape file because they're both lines. And then they would go into the attribute table and create three different fields in the attribute table. The first they would uh, declare a field and write in whether it was a road or a pipe, that particular line. That way they know which is which. And then they would have another field for the diameter and then another field for the speed limit. And if they've typed in that a particular line segment uh, was a uh, pipe, then they would leave the speed limit just blank uh, and type in the diameter. If they would do the reverse then for the roads, leaving the diameter blank if it were a road and just typing in the speed limit. This is not good practice and the reason goes back to our discussion of storing attribute, table, uh, attribute, attribute data in the data tables. So remember that when we declare a field we have to declare exactly what type it is uh, and then when we do that the computer reserves a certain amount of storage space for every single one of those cells in the field. Therefore it's a huge waste of space and not to mention if inefficient in other ways to have cells in that data file that are going to be left blank that aren't going to store any data anyway because you're saving storage space for them. That's no good. So go ahead and divide those two into two different feature classes where every feature class or every feature in that file has the same attributes. So in many cases these two criteria come rather naturally to people who have already been working with GIS a little bit. Uh, they may think about different sets of data and when they do they think about different files with different uh, or the same geometry inside each file and the same attributes inside each file. This sort of becomes second nature and in fact sometimes when I ask students in second or third uh, semester GIS classes what uh, the criteria of feature classes are, they might not even immediately think of these because they're so obvious and they're like, oh yes, I know that. It's something that uh, we just do. But it's very important for us to make explicit notes of these things, even if you consider them obvious, so that we specify them uh, and know what our best practices are. But there's one more criteria for having a feature class that's not as often thought of even though it, it is very important. And that's that the geometry collected for each of these files must have been collected using the same coordinate system. We want to be sure that every single uh, feature in the data file has been collected using the same set of assumptions about the size and shape of the Earth. And that should make intuitive sense to you uh, if you think about it. Uh, we know that making assumptions about the size and shape of the Earth uh, when we do that, we can get very different coordinates, uh, coordinate measurements for the same location on the planet. And that's why we update our set of assumptions periodically as our technology improves for measuring the exact size and shape of the Earth. And, uh, uh, and that does result in some of the coordinates for the location, certain locations, changing in order to better reflect the new measurements or to better reflect their actual position because of the new measurements. But if we go outside with a GPS receiver to collect some data about, uh, say, where each tree is uh, on the university campus, you'd want to set your receiver to a particular set of assumptions about the size and shape of the Earth and then go take all of the measurements. It wouldn't make sense to go out and take, uh, set your uh, receiver to a certain coordinate system, go out, take three or four tree measurements, then change up your coordinate system, go take three or four more, then change up your whole coordinate system again and go finish uh, all of the rest of the trees. That really wouldn't make sense. So uh, we want to ensure, so in order to have a feature class as part of our best practices, we want to uh, remember that in the broad sense, in order to have a feature class, every single feature in the file must be collected according to the same coordinate system. Okay, so that's what a feature class is in the broad sense, conforming to these three standards. The same geometry for every feature in the file, 
the same attribute information for every feature in the file and using the same coordinate system to collect all the geometry for every feature in the file. So whenever you create vector GIS data sets, this is your best practice for the GIS data collection, creation, and all of your management. All right, well, I'll see you in the next video.